Welcome back. Um, I'm delighted to be your host again for this next session, which is getting to the heart of hospitality. Uh, we've got two seasoned hotel and travel experts with tons. They look young, but they've got tons of experience dealing with high end Indian travellers. We have uh, Malik J. Fernando, who is the managing director of Resplendent Ceylon, the first Sri Lankan luxury resort brand. Um, you have three distinctive resorts, I believe, connected by, as you say, a thread of quality and service. Um, I should also add, by the way, Malik is also director of the Dilmar Tea, which was set up by his father. It's the first producer-owned tea brand. And I think it's, that's interesting, that that background. Well, maybe that'll come up a little bit. You're also uh, spearheading the Sri Lanka Tourism Alliance to mobilise the private tourism sector to act swiftly and strategically uh, with the Love Sri Lanka banner that I know that you use. And you're also director of Sri Lankan Airlines. So you have fingers in many pies. <laughs> Uh, well, I, so we'll hopefully bring all of them to bear shortly. Um, I can also welcome Hemal Jain, who is the general manager of Alila Villas uh, Uluwatu in Bali in Indonesia. That particular place has won many prestigious awards and accolades, uh, the most recent being one of the top five resorts in Indonesia, one of the top 15 resorts in Asia and top 100 hotels in the world by one particular organization. So here we are going to focus on how hotel and travel providers have navigated the desires of affluent Indian travelers over the decades and how this is changing now and how it's certainly changed in the last few years. Before we get there, uh, I think I do have to ask you about the current situation um, in both your countries because there have, or both your destinations, because there have obviously been some recent challenges for both of you to deal with. So let's deal with Sri Lanka, Malik, first of all. And on the positive side, there are signs of recovery out there. Um, I think the country received nearly 500,000 tourists um, until the end of August was the latest figures I think we've had on that. So what's your message to travellers who are looking to come to Sri Lanka for a holiday, say this winter season, but may be apprehensive for, because of what they've heard? Thanks. Thanks, Rajan. Lovely to be here. Hi, Hemal. Um, Sri Lanka is entirely back to normal. I mean, we went through a blip in... April and May, uh, political stability has returned and tourism is again picking up for the winter. But you wouldn't believe me if you read the Indian media because we had a barrage of negativity related to also geopolitics because of our China tilt. So the Indian media was actually very, very aggressively portraying a position which in my view was large, highly exaggerated. So if you ask the average Indian consumer they think Sri Lanka, is it safe? My goodness, you know, are you, do you have enough to eat? Is there fuel? Uh, but it's actually back to normal. It's got to the point where we are now issuing something called Resplendent Diaries, where we feature American, British, Indian travelers having a perfectly normal holiday. So essentially our biggest challenge now is, uh, and our team are coming out to India next week, is to convince the Indian traveler our trade partners know it's safe because we've been communicating with them. But because of that media barrage, people still think that there is still unrest. There are still shortages. But no, these are gone as of two or three months ago. So it is the same old Sri Lanka that Indian travelers have visited and loved um, until earlier on this year. And we had a fabulous season post-COVID uh, post um, up till March or April. And I'm hoping that we'll have another good season this winter. So bottom line is don't believe everything you read in the media. You know, we had a few uh, issues. We had shortages due to entire, you know, purely due to mismanagement, but basically we're A-OK. -okay. And I'll, I'll tell you more as we go on. Right. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Hemal, we already heard how popular Bali seemed to be amongst the travel designing community. So what's the latest there? How much have you recovered since, you know what, and, uh, and how's it been in the last six months? Sure, sure. So hello, Rajan, and uh, hi, Malik. Uh, Totally, totally, I'm with you on this, uh, Malik. Uh, media reports are absolutely exaggerated. Uh, but yes, coming to Bali, I mean, recovery here has been absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, on the island... Oh, I think he's frozen. Have we lost him, Al? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just transfer it to you, Malik. Let's just talk a little bit more about Sri Lanka and the affluent traveler um what i mean did anything 
change in terms of the affluent traveller over the last couple? I'll come back to you again, Himal. We, Himal, we just lost you slightly. Has yeah. anything um, changed in terms of the affluent travellers um, uh, suiting their demands when it comes to Sri Lanka? Or has Sri Lanka always had that old school, little bit of colonial, beautiful kind of you know offer for them? I mean, there was the old Sri Lanka, which had the typical circuit of you know mid-level hotels, and in the last eight or nine years with the high-end properties like our circuit of three relay chateau properties coming and so on, Indians rediscovered Sri Lanka. I remember when I first came out there maybe eight, nine years ago, I had a hell of a time convincing travel agents that Sri Lanka had luxury. So it was a, it, it was a slow build. But then, you know, we had a few loyal supporters in the trade who sent us a few guests. And then the, the tide turned. So it's only, honestly, Rajan, in the last six years or seven years that we've had luxury Indian travelers uh, coming to this market because they looked down on Sri Lanka. You know, they went to the Maldives, they might go somewhere else. And of course, it coincides with, you know, the growing wealth and affluence in India. Uh, so it's it's a fairly recent phenomenon and you don't really have more than, you know, five or ten properties that uh, the affluent Indian traveler would stay in. But I must say that our numbers from India um, have gone up to about seven or eight percent. And I think it'll be 10 or 15 soon because we're convenient. We're on your doorstep. You don't need a visa. We're very flexible with your booking. To, you know, particularly during COVID, you could sort of cancel the day before if someone fell sick. So for us, it's something fairly new. But the Indian se traveler segment, I mean, Indian travelers are very demanding. We know that. But we're used to that. We can handle that. You know, uh, they love their food and drink. Um, and there again, we really, really score because that really is the ethos of Relais Chateau. So I would say the Indian traveler is probably the most demanding traveler in the entire world. Not that the Sri Lankans aren't demanding, but it takes a certain kind of property. I'm sure Alila does it well, and Resplendent Ceylon does it well, judging by the number of you know repeat um, guests that we get. So very demanding, uh, and I'm sure that the agents who are listening also would, would concur with that. Is the, but, is, Malik, is the, is, the, is the millennial Gen Z traveler, are they as demanding? Are they different? Are, are, you know, do they want different things? They're a little bit less demanding. In fact, glad you said that because we had a pop the question proposal by a prominent couple from India uh, three or four days ago, which I loved because it also sent the message that, hey, Sri Lanka's open and these guys are coming to get married here, so they must be quite safe. And there were like, you know, 4,000, 5,000 likes on Facebook, uh, sorry, on Instagram. So those travelers are, I must say, a little bit less demanding than the older generations, but want more experiences like other, or, you know, like other origins. And, you know, want something quirky, funky, but still, you know, even if they're paying a premium price at, at a high end accommodation, you know, you know, they, they want that service delivery because they're pampered yeah. at home. You know, they have staff waiting on them. So it's not like the British traveler who, you know, sort of feels a bit nervous being dealt with by a butler. The Indian traveler is quite used to that because they have butlers at home. Uh, so uh, when they come to our resorts, um, you know, we, we pamper them like they're at home, but the younger crowd actually want more activities outside the resort and sort of unique kind of set setups and experiences for which hoteliers need to be very flexible. We're going to come back to that. I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Hemal, we, we lost you briefly right. there. Um, you were just saying that, that Bali is, is in a good place right now. Do you want to address the, the, uh, well, the, the difference between generations and then perhaps how younger travellers are, are, want yeah. different things? Sure, sure. And as I was saying, you know, recovery has actually been absolutely fantastic and we're getting guests from all around the world. And as quickly as Bali uh, shut down uh, with, because of the pandemic, uh, things also came back uh, as quickly, uh, which we did not expect. So we have guests from the US, Australia, Singapore, India and Middle East. Now, you guys were talking about the demography and what I am personally seeing in my luxury resort is, 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 the age group changing, you know, from now we get guests from 29 years to 45 years. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we would get guests from 45 plus plus, you know, who would like to just be in the resort and spend time. But but these guests are, uh, I mean, the current flood of guests that we are getting are totally changing. Uh, they want to enjoy the finer things. They want to go out, enjoy the destination experiences and and. Most of the demand that we are getting now is, of course, the pent-up demand, you know, but uh, it's been huge. Roughly, we are 
almost sitting at about 70 80% occupancies now and these guests are all traveling long haul they are spending a lot of money on airfares and hence they don't mind splurging on you know good activities uh, good leisure and luxury properties uh, which is giving them great fine experiences so i think with g20 around the corner bali's demand i don't think uh, is going to die down anytime soon uh, we are all uh, expecting a lot more guests to come in up until uh, march next year for sure great i mean obviously bali as well has been for a long time has had the reputation of attracting young party people and backpackers mm -hmm. and, and th those are the kind of people i suspect that, it, that even affluent millennials will probably right. want to mix with and, and meet is that, am i right absolutely and and i mean i really do not see any challenges uh, and honestly uh, i do not want to make any challenges up uh, you know for the sake of this uh, session affluent indian <laughs> travelers are as savvy and as well traveled as any other guest and i am seeing it personally live in my property and also in bali and through your medium here today rajan you know i would like to urge the industry at large to look at this segment with great great interest i still personally feel that uh, industry is not really looking at this segment as yet as they would you know for example would have seen china uh, pre pandemic now this segment is going to explode in days to come and people from india are longing to go out and travel the world to exotic destinations and and bali and sri lanka being uh, uh, two of them as my favorite destination i've been there many times fantastic little country now look at what happened in maldives during the pandemic india was one of the top market and even during the pandemic indians wanted to get out and splurge and spend the money in beautiful things great destination experiences so yes no challenges let's be very open to this market look at what their demands are digitally it's a very digitally savvy market look at what their demands are digitally and then act accordingly now malik you talked about quirky and funky uh, is in demand in sri lanka what's quirky and funky in, in sri lanka that you can offer them See the thing is this, Rajan. You know, Sri Lanka offers. It's a small island. It's probably the size of you know Greater Mumbai or something. But we offer as much diversity as an entire continent. So typically, our circuit starts in the tea country, say at Ceylon Tea Trails, and you go down to Wild Coast Lodge, safari. So you see leopards by the beach, and then Cape Eligama, uh, which is an amazing surfing hotspot. So the variety of things you can do. It is a multi-elemental destination. Say you talk about the Maldives. You go to the Maldives and there aren't a huge number of things to do, right? But if you want diversity, if you want variety, if you want to go on a crocodile safari, you want to go blue whale watching half an hour later, you want to see a leopard in this hotspot, um, which is called Yala National Park. That variety that we offer, particularly for the younger traveler, who, you know, the older traveler might want to spend more time in the hotel, wellness and so on and F&B. Younger traveler wants to explore. So I think that variety that this country offers and the number of things you can do with this mask making at Cape Peligama, starting your surf classes also at Cape Peligama, you know, learning the art of tea, planting your own tea bush, which we give you updates on periodically up at Ceylon Tea Trails on the Dilma plantations. That variety of things, our guys, we've got something called, uh, you know, we don't have a concierge, but we have a curator who kind of comes to where you are and curates your day if, if you would like it to. Some people would just like to chill. And we'll actually create experiences on the fly that we don't pick up out of a book necessarily. Um, and so that flexibility... Give me an example of that. Give me an example. That sounds fascinating. Give me an example. What, how, yeah, so how, how do you create an experience on the fly? Yeah. So basically, if say someone says, look, I'm uh, really interested in, in, in pottery or I'm really interested in, in, in you know, arts and crafts, We'll take them to the village, which is literally at the bottom of the, of the road there. And we've got the lady who's actually not doing things for tourists, but she's doing pottery making. And they'll sit the guests down and they'll actually, you know, show them how things are made, the conversion of the clay. Um, the other day, somebody um, wants to learn about, um, about mask making. Because, you know, we, people buy these beautiful old, you know, there's a lot of history behind it, culture masks. So we actually took them to... A small place that actually isn't geared for tourists and we actually got them to make their own masks and it became such a you know such a hit that we decided to call this guy to the resort periodically and he'll do the mask making for guests so it's a very broad canvas of things that we can offer 
that is the diversity that this country offers. Uh, and tragically, and this is my pet uh, uh, peeve, is that uh, you know we just don't communicate it. You know, we just don't communicate right. it at a country level. But as individual hoteliers, uh, we have to push these angles and promote the country. Uh, you know, in our mutual interests. So it, it's really. I think what you said there, Malik, is really interesting as well, because you're talking about authenticity to a certain extent as well. You are talking about you make up something. It's not on a big tourist trail. You go to local village where, the, as you say, the lady is making these things anyway. And the and that gives the individual traveler something really unique, doesn't it, to, to experience? Oh, oh. You know, Rajan, authenticity is really that one word that most travelers, it's not leave with. It's not a canned experience. Because our people are genuinely warm, even in adversity, with the 60% inflation we've been dealing with for a variety of reasons. They still smile, they're still warm, they're still welcome. Travelers were always safe, despite the brief period of unrest that we had. And those who've been here know what our people are like. It's that authenticity. They'll invite you into their house. They'll show you how to make this yara which is which means yard tea, which is kind of you pour it from an angle of a yard, and you know everyone has their own little recipe, kind of like the chais that you have in India. So it's it's that connection that you make, which kind of attracts travelers to come here yeah. again and again. It's not a mass market canned experience. Authenticity that you know you hit the nail on the head. That's really what we offer. Totally. And Himal, I suspect that's also your experience when you're talking particularly about affluent uh, travellers. I mean, again, they want something different, don't they? They don't want the canned experience, if you like. So what can you, I mean, you know, they come to your resort, they come, what can you offer them that is different? Right. I mean, see, if you, if you, if you look at an itinerary for an affluent Indian traveller, you know, it is, it is, it is a packed itinerary. Affluent Indian traveler and Indian traveler at large want something to do. You know, they want action. They want to do things all the time. They just don't want to stay in the hotel and, you know, uh, kill time. Uh, what we see here in Bali is adventure-based activities are very popular. And, and especially at a level of resort, uh, it is spa and romance. That is something which the savvy Indian traveler is wanting more and more. Uh, the, the age demography is changing and it is more younger crowd that is coming in. And hence, spy and romance is always, uh, I mean, based activities are always on top of things. So for luxury resorts like us, you know, we set up many experiences that would be a mix and match of enjoying facilities at the hotel and also outside. So I'll give you an example. We have an experience called as a journey to romance at sunset. So we take you out, we drive you 15 minutes, we take you onto a beach. You get into a small boat, you and your wife, your partner, you get into the middle of the ocean, you see the sun setting down, we serve you bubbles, we give you canopies, we bring you back and then we uh, have done a surprise setup of this beautiful million candles light dinner with, with five course, uh, wine pairing, degustation menu. So that's something, you know, that a savvy and an affluent Indian traveler is loving it. We also have set up a system, you know, where we can tailor make a guest itinerary as per the likes and dislikes. So you check in, we understand what your requirements are. You sit down with our, our leisure concierge curators, as we call them, and then we uh, set it up uh, as per what they want. Uh, one thing that we always see with the Indian traveler, savvy, non-savvy, all kinds, is, is vegetarian food. Uh, vegetarian food is, is, is paramount. And, and yes, they're well-traveled. Uh, they would stay in Bali for eight, nine nights. But uh, I would still prefer maybe after three, four nights, uh, a nice Indian meal, you know, and, and vegetarian based options are always uh, helpful. Uh, clubbing, partying, shopping are important elements as well. And putting that on the itinerary is, is as important as any destination driven experiences. Well, just stop there because we have a really, really interesting question uh, from Keva uh, Chawal Kapoor, uh, who just says, quite simply, how important is alcohol? For a luxury traveler, right? Well, how would you answer that question? Let's let's yeah. go to you first, Malik. I think it's very important, particularly <laughs> wine, right? Even if you don't want to party and all of that, you know, yes, you know, nice bottle of wine with your meal, an aperitif, you know, nice rosé sitting on a cliff lookout at you know at um, sunset. Um, I mean, if you if you drink alcohol, many choose not to. 
Uh, I think the availability of a good selection, you know, interesting mixology. Uh, we do a lot of tea, Dilma tea related, you know, uh, uh, cocktails with, with, with tea and so on. I think it is very, very important, particularly with meals. Um, not necessarily hard alcohol, but I think it's, it's a key part of any, any luxury holiday. Do I sound like an alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I apologise to, to, to Kavya, by the way. I got Kavya's name wrong there, so apologies. It's my eyesight. Uh, Hemal, how, how important is alcohol? Oh, just that point. I think he deliberately... I, I think on Hemal me. is a non <laughs> He's not there. You annoyed him, Rajan. <laughs> we'll, find him in a sec we'll find him in a second. Now, listen, there's one thing I do want to talk about, which is this. Going, just going a little back to, to the sustainability aspect and, and how much... The local community is important. Now, I know that part of the philosophy of your tea brand is going beyond just business. Oh, you're back, Kim. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second. Yes. Um, sure. And that 15% of the earnings that you have are directed towards social justice and environment through your charitable foundation. So that's a big thing for you, right? For actually the tea and the hotel side of the business, of course, the last year has been you know, not, not, not so good with COVID and so on. But in a good year, uh, it'll be a substantial donation. To our own foundation, which is 200 people running it, we don't believe in writing checks. Uh, we do the work ourselves. We are the largest private sector charity in the country. So we touch the lives of about 200,000 people, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, uh, you know, the different able people. So it's a critical part of our business. And guests have the opportunity at each of our resorts to see our activities. We have community centers where the villagers, you know, we run the school um the, you know the, the kindergarten we do classes for the fishermen so it, you know it's something that that my father inculcated in my brother and me and i think it's something which we've been doing for some time without making much of a noise but guests are now insisting to know what it is what are the good works that we do from a social justice perspective as well as an environmental perspective and that is becoming even more important now with the climate crisis so we really like to believe that we walk the talk and we try and sort of highlight to guess what we do, not from a marketing spiel, but more as in terms of, you know, serving as a role model for other hotels and travel businesses and other businesses in the country. Because uh, it is critical because my father's motto was business is a matter of human service. So unless because, you know, governments in our part of the world don't do a particularly good job of looking after the people. So we have to chip in where we can. Um, and our guests actually have the opportunity of experiencing that in, in, in different ways when they're with us. And to be, to be blunt, Malik, would, would the affluent, even super rich Indian traveller actually care? Would they be interested in what you're talking about? Initially, less so. The most empathetic were British and European travellers, Americans. We found that people who were traveling, you know, because Indian affluent traveling is still fairly new. Uh, just like you had that um, burst in Russia uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, where it was all about where do I go, bucket list, you know, be shown in all the right locations. But latterly, in the last few years, we've seen that happening, particularly with a, a younger crowd. As I mentioned earlier, they, you know, particularly the climate crisis is something that's very central to their thought process. They're experiencing it in their homes. So I think increasingly, welcomingly so, it is starting to happen. Maybe not with the older traveller, but with the younger traveller, yes. Okay. Um, and Himal, I think you're, you're on record as saying that you believe that the modern day luxury traveller is looking for sustainability in travel and to contribute in some way to the environment and to the community. Again, tell me it's not just lip service because there, I mean, we, and we had this in the previous session where as soon as everyone's back in travel, they can you know there is this aspect where they just forget about all that and just get back into right. traveling like before right, right. what's your experience sure sure i mean we have been big advocate of sustainability and and we we preach uh, sustainability is the new luxury and we not only preach it we practice it and an example could be the world of care video that the chairman of hyatt released uh, talking about alila villa zulawatu as a role model and as an example for all hotels around the world. And uh, the program that Malik was talking about, you know, we have a similar program, which we call as Gift to Share. Now, Gift to Share is, is, is basically inviting, it's basically a stay three, pay two. 
So you stay three nights, but you only pay for two nights. However, we tell a guest that uh, we are booking you on this specific package called as a gift to share. And we ask you to donate the third night uh, of your wish, of your will to this foundation that we are supporting, which is, you know, taking care of all the girl, uh, girl childs in Bali, in Indonesia, who do not have a home. So this is an educational organization which houses them, trains them, and later they are, you know, uh, uh, taken in any of the hotels and resorts uh, around Indonesia. So we invite guests and we were, we were surprised, Rajan and Malik. I mean, we, we made about a million dollars through this particular uh, uh, package, as we call it. And, and the donations that we have got is, is we are amazed. And yes, these are coming from all guests from all around the world, uh, also from the Indian guests. So we have managed to get about 10,000 US dollars only in donation. And, and some of it has also... No, I was going to say, it, it really chimes in with what a lot of people are saying to me in the travel business. And we, we know all this talk about how, you know, originally travel was transactional. You just buy a holiday. Secondly, it was experiential. You want to be doing stuff. You want to be doing right. interesting things. The third one is um, transformational. And part of that is feeling good about what you've done on your on your trip, I guess. I mean, you're really feeling that from customers? Absolutely. And, and look, I mean, what everybody has gone through during the pandemic, I mean, the whole world was shut. Everybody was sitting and everybody in their home and they were all suffering, most of them, you know. And and during after the pandemic, one when you are spending so much of dollars on a flight ticket, when you are coming and, you know, splurging on great luxury resorts, amazing destination experiences, you, you want to, you know, go back with the feeling that, okay, you have done something for that place, uh, which was suffering uh, two years ago or maybe a few months ago. And, and a little thing here and there goes a long way. And, and we are definitely seeing this trend, not only with the Indian market, but globally. There is, a, there is a lot of sense of care. There is a lot of empathy. Yes, customers and guests are getting demanding. Why? Because they are paying a lot of money and they better. I mean, that's all fine. But yes, they want, they want to show that they care for the planet that they're living in. And we are seeing this live, Rajan. Okay. In a second, I just want to talk about um, in terms of the, the policies you have within the hotels, how much your hotel uh, ambience environment is changing over time, what you're doing to, to improve that. But there is a question from Tony Davis, who's from New Zealand, um, which slightly relates to the whole community thing, I, I suspect, which is that shopping was mentioned earlier. Now, she, um, Tony says, is this in the broad sense of shopping just for luxury brands or is the affluent traveler interested in items that are unique to the country or local cultures? Uh, like she says, um, wool products or honey, that's probably a New Zealand thing. But but you mentioned masks, but maybe that's more crafts. But yes, obviously you can go to the big shopping center and buy stuff that's made in China or made anywhere in the world. But are people looking for local stuff? Absolutely. Um, let me start with you, Malik. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I think so, right? I mean, depending on which destination they go to, but certainly when they come to Sri Lanka, they're looking at, at something authentic that's, you know, that's, that's, that's craft based, uh, something, you know, as a memento of their holiday. So, you know, if they'd come here to buy a brand name watch or a brand name ha handbag, um, you know, that, that, that probably wouldn't be us. But if you certainly look at um, what we, so we've got a curated selection of, of products and um, local stores that we recommend people. So, I mean, of course, when you come to Sri Lanka, you'd buy a star sapphire or something and you'd buy, buy some tea and so on. But I think, you know, increasingly people want something that they don't regularly have. You might have a Chinese traveler who travels overseas and, you know, wants to buy X, Y, Z, whatever, and go back and sell it. But generally you find the affluent traveler wants something different from the, for, for themselves, which reminds them of the holiday, which is not your you know bog standard brand x or y if it's a local brand but it's got to be beautifully designed beautifully packaged nicely curated you do you know they wouldn't want to compromise on that experience but the product itself uh, has to be very beautifully positioned and and sold um and i think they want to pay they're quite happy to pay a premium price also for such a product and particularly if it's you know made by local craftsmen and there is a sort of provenance to the local area um all the better um, so I think definitely they'd choose that if that kind of product is available. Emil, 
same experience same same yeah absolutely i mean i mean if you are looking to buy luxury louis vuitton or a gucci you know you don't need to come to bali i mean you can get it in bombay delhi calcutta anywhere you know and and when you come to bali you take local you know you take local artisanal products and and i'll give you an example so we had this young couple from delhi and we were talking about age demography and stuff so this couple was 32 years old and and they were supposed to check out and they go to the airport and they feel that no they haven't tried uh, something they haven't tried to stay at alila villa zolowatu and this is a this is a very recent story so they they miss their flight they cancel it they come and stay with us and when i interacted with them you know they they were giving me examples of of local products that they have seen in bali which they want to now carry to india i mean this is the first time i'm hearing somebody carrying an item from bali to india because india in itself is very diversified has everything for every taste but but yes there is a growing interest so we have a boutique in the property which caters to only local artisans from bali and and we do not have any international products it's these are hand woven stuff these are our products made from you know by women by men you know by local people and definitely in big demand interesting interesting okay let's look at the um actual day to day um attitudes behavior uh, the way that you run your, ho- your your hotels now are things changing I, i when i last did this this conference one thing that some of the hoteliers said to me was that they're encouraging their staff to mix more with 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 clients that the clients like that that it isn't just somebody behind a desk uh who's just quiet and doing their job there's much more kind of a sense of equality as well between staff and and clients is that is that am i accurate there am i right there malik 100% if you look at the feedback uh, we don't have any desks uh you know everything is you know being small resorts no check-ins and so on um most of our feedback either in house surveys or on trip advisor or whatever refers to two three four staff by name they become firm friends i mean sri lanka is any warm well farming you know welcoming and they, and they they become hosts um and i think that connection with local staff with the local staff talk about their families talk about their aspirations it becomes a personal connection right because typically on holiday the length of stay is much longer than on a business trip so um absolutely because people you know, particularly kind of you know affluent clients also tend to be more curious more interested um and there is a huge amount of engagement apart from the fact that as i said earlier you know we curate their journey there's a lot of interaction you know cookie cutter stuff so we anyhow talk with a lot of guests so we attract a particular kind of of staff member whose communication skills are good who are empathetic who are warm you know because we don't have any buffets we don't have a front desk as i said we don't have a concierge who sort of rolls out you know bog standard recommendations so um that we encourage our guests to engage not not be overly um you know hovering around and so on but there's always these interactions where a bartender would you know concoct a local cocktail you know that he foraged that afternoon and then have a long discussion um you know about 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 the local area the history of sri lanka and so on and you see that because over 50 to 60% of our feedback refers to staff members by name and i think that's critical for any origin where people feel that they've actually connected with people you know everyone wants to be a global citizen so it's not just I've been to sri lanka I've been it's a, it's a software strength that we bring to bear and we really encourage that amongst our staff okay emal yeah because in the old days it was very much the staff were like quiet and subservient and they just you know just do what the the rich demanding customer wants and and keep out of their way has that, has that changed in your experience right i mean i totally echo what uh, what malik is saying and personalization is the key out and out you have to be not a hotelier sitting in the office and you know commanding you have to be a very consummate host and and what i love to call in my property is being an innkeeper you have to run hotel these small beautiful luxury resorts being an innkeeper you know and 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 i'll give you a simple uh, quote you know when you when you sell a commodity you always sell it at a price but when you sell an experience you sell it on the basis of relationships now if you are not personalizing any stay if you are not 
having relationships with your guests, with your travel advisors from around the world. I am totally in that this industry is going to fail at large. Hence, personalization is the key out and out. Uh, we have tried to take personalization to a very different uh, level. Uh, we have defined our butler services into four distinct uh, segments called as private, discreet, indulgent, environmental friendly. Uh, we have a personal preference menu, which we give to all our guests prior to the arrival, telling them, all right, share your preferences with us. Let us get to know you better. And either we can do it, and if we cannot do it, we will also let you know once you arrive. It's not that we cannot or we can only do everything. Hence, personalization is the key. And, and, and the more we personalize, the more we have better engagement and relationship with our guests, uh, not only as general managers or as leaders, but also as our team, you know, as our colleagues. I think I think uh, that is here to stay, and that is going to be the key driver uh, in years to come. Rajan, if that I makes you distinct. distinct. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Malik, go on. If I just add something to that, uh, and I'm sure it's the same with Alila, is that, you know, when you've got a great product and you've got a great team, the staff, the team, we call them ambassadors, are passionate about it. They are Absolutely. passionate about the food. They are passionate about the wildlife experience. They're passionate about the cocktail that their friend, the bartender makes. You can't hold that passion back. So they are bursting to share it with guests and to engage with them. So it comes from passion because without passion, you can't have engagement. You can't have sterile communication. And the affluent traveler knows when someone is just chit chatting for the sake of engagement versus a really interactive, passionate engagement. So I think we share that, you know, it depends on the caliber of team, uh, staff you have. If you've got a great product and you've got passionate members of staff, uh, you can't avoid them interacting productively with guests and the guests loving it. Right. And also one more thing, Rajan, quickly. For the affluent traveler, price is not important. Experiences. That is something that we are watching. We are watching, you know, because... Sometimes, you know, you'll go into some hotel, the team will, the guests ask something and the team will say, all right, it is going to cost this much. Our guests don't want to hear because they are paying $1,000 a night and they don't want to hear too much about, okay, what is this going to cost and what is this transportation cost? No, it's about the experience, how you set up that car for that local journey, local experience. That detailing is important. So that's the experience. Okay, I want to ask you just a few specific questions. We've got some little bit of time left. Um, when it comes to, we just had, a, I just had a panel with three very good travel designers. I mean, they're probably bigger than that in terms of the title. But how much do you deal with them, or do they are they an impediment to, to you doing your job well, uh, Malik? No, no, they're critical. Most of them are my friends. <laughs> they are absolutely critical, and these are the designers who, when I first knocked on their door, I said, "I'm from Sri Lanka." I've got three Relay Chateau lodges. They said Sri Lanka. And then now they are my firm friends. Uh, there's one or two who've never been to my properties, but send us guests regularly. And these, I mean, these are, I think of them as members of my team because they're passionate about the product because they, they know that they can reach out and, you know, sort out any issue or get any specific advice or guidance. So I think particularly for the Indian traveler, uh, who wants someone to hold their hand, to guide them, you know, what circuit to do in what sequence, what time of year, what kind of room, what kind of experience. Um, I think it's absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, and, you know, everything is outsourced. They manage, you know, the client's expectations. It makes my life easier as well because they give me a heads up as to likes and dislikes and how to handle the client. Um, and uh, so... If, and so, so it's interesting, you, you just, sorry, Malik, you just said that they manage expectations. That's something that's occurred to me, particularly at the high end of affluent travellers. There must be in this sense of almost expectation inflation. They're just constantly wanting more and more so it's different to what their friends have got. I don't know. Is that a pressure? So you find that during the stay of a particularly demanding group or a couple the travel designer, advisor, and myself and my team, we actually jointly manage the stay. It's not like the travel advisor makes the booking, okay, Malik, over to you, and I'm going off somewhere else. Uh, we are jointly managing the client 
managing, you know, if they're being unreasonable or if they want, because the tra- the client still wants to interact. They might tell the travel advisor, look, I'd like this for lunch in half an hour, you know, and then we talk or whatever. So I think it's a very integral part. So I think of, of, of uh, some of the travel advisors we work with closely as really a member of my team. And I hope they think the same of, of me in Sri Lanka because we jointly manage the client uh, and to ensure that they have a memorable uh, stay with us and come back again. Emma, yep, you work with them? You work with travel designers? Yes, we, have been, we have been working with luxury travel advisors from all around the world since a very, very long time. And, and, and as, as, as a resort, as a brand, we are also uh, members of, of the uh, Virtuoso, the American Express, Centurion preferred programs, higher privy uh, preferred programs and we deal with them all the time 80 percent of my business is coming in through them whether it is now even the luxury travel designers book online but these are uh, proper uh, high net worth individuals that these designers are actually sending Uh, travel advisors role post pandemic world is now going to be the key because they are actually the curators of a guest experience both at the destination level and at the property level. Now, they know the guest, uh, they know their clients very well. And as Malik was saying, they they pre-advise us before they are uh, arriving, what they like, what they don't like, what we should do, what we should not be doing. And uh, generally, they take care of guests, as we call it, from door to door. You know, so the moment they leave their house in their country and the moment they enter our house in, 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 in our hotel. So... The number of bookings we are getting from the likes of American Express Virtuoso has increased. And that's because a luxury traveler is more confident utilizing their services as they know that end to end services are being taken care of. And the event, you know, that there is something that happens in between the journey. They have a luxury travel advisor to fall back on. And hence it is it is very important. And luxury travel advisors are going to play a critical role in the post pandemic era. Okay, great. Okay, we got just a few minutes left. A couple of questions I want to ask you. Um, the first one is: there are obviously people watching who are keen to perhaps play the roles that you play, and you know, and that maybe take time. They're going to, you know, you, you are obviously in very good positions at the moment. But what are your recommendations to people either aspiring to be doing the kind of thing that you do, or perhaps already work in this market? What should they do to cater? to that segment, to the Indian affluent, affluent um, tra- traveler? What, what's the best thing that they can, they can do? Your advice. Hema, I'll start with you. I mean, the best thing that you would like to do uh, for an affluent Indian traveler is, first is be absolutely honest to what you're offering. And, and do not try and, you know, uh, decorate uh, things. Uh, they have seen it. Yeah, they have seen it all. You know, an affluent Indian traveler has seen a lot that goes on in their own country. And hence, you have got to be really honest of what you are providing. Service is critical. Uh, they do not like a bad service. They, they like good service. They like to be attended to. And, and as much as they are well-traveled, they are well-educated, uh, they like to be spoken to. They like to try final things of life. Uh, food is important. Uh, vegetarian food is important. Some hotels where I personally go, you know, um, mistake a vegetarian affluent Indian traveler uh, wanting a good dessert as a fruit platter. They don't accept that. It's not going to work. So they have probably tried a lot of desserts in their own country. So, but, but you need to serve a refined model of that Indian food or a refined French cuisine or Italian cuisine. All can be made vegetarian. So Service, being honest, and food are integral parts. Okay. And to you, Malik? So, I mean, great hardware that goes without saying. Um, and then service and food. I mean, I think food, um, you need to have, it's got to be a broad, it's, you've got to be versatile, meaning that you can make Indian food um, on occasion, or as authentic as possible. And in our case, we don't have Indian chefs, but our chefs are very well trained and they turn out fabulous Indian food, but also fine dining, um, Western fusion. So you need that range where someone might suddenly decide, okay, comfort food, um, I'd like something from home. And then I'd like to, you know, travel the world or, you know, try something uniquely Sri Lankan and service because they are used to being waited on hand and foot uh, back home. 
so not necessarily obsequious service, but you know, friendly, warm, genuine service. Okay. Um, and I think uh, you know, attention. Um, you know, the general manager, you know, the resort hosts. You know, they want interaction, so you know, prompt responses and so on. So it's uh, very much software oriented. Given that you've got a great product in terms of you know everything working and comfortable rooms and so on, it's really food and service. Uh, which go hand in glove because you're spending four or five hours a day. They have very long meals. I would say the Indian traveler probably has, and like the Sri Lankan traveler, you probably spend five hours a day sitting, uh, you know, at, at the restaurant table, you know, chit chatting away. So great food and great service. Um, I think that is what is critical. Okay, just one last quick thing, which is that you know, obviously, this whole conference uh, um, and you know, this we talk about expert led travel intelligence briefings here, discussions and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, ultimately, is the Indian affluent traveler, do you think what I said before, which is a major significant development in the evolution of travel? You you uh, have, have had, you know, you've got experience of, of having them. But around the world, are you seeing this segment becoming a really major part, if they're not already, a really major part of the future of the travel industry? Uh, again, I'll go to you, you first, Hemal. Sure, and totally. I mean, Rajan, as I was saying in the beginning, please do not ignore this affluent, world-class travel, Indian, Indian travel market. And if you do that, you are ignoring them at your own peril. Now, this will be a bigger revolution than what I personally felt, you know, being in Bali, handling the Chinese market. This will be much, much bigger than that. And this will be a lot more stable market. Chinese market is still not very stable, even though a pre-pandemic was big, but it wasn't stable. But Indian affluent and Indian market in general is going to be a very stable outbound market immediately up until next five years. And that is going to define Indian tourism in the on the world stage. Second option, I mean, second point that I would like to make quickly is look at the digital trends coming out of this market. Indians are probably spending a lot of time on their palm, on their white screen, look at that trend and then adapt and readapt your services at the, at the hotel level, resort level, you know, at your, at your place, because they have probably more access to information than what we can ever imagine. And the trends are changing very, very quickly. Uh, 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 well-traveled guest staying for seven days in one particular hotel may demand something else in another when he goes to another destination. So that trend is to watch out for. Okay. Yeah, very one, quickly, Malik. One hundred percent. I think India has already outstripped China in terms of population. The Indian traveler is more open, the English speaking, more exposed, um, and I think is going to travel a lot more. You might have the odd Chinese bucket list traveler; they'll you know operate to a certain zone. But I think the Indian traveler is more adventurous. Um, he's going to travel more times. He's, you know, he's more of a global traveler than the Chinese traveler is. Um, so answer is yes, I think it is going to be the most potent force in, in luxury travel in the next decade. And I hope that we, you know, Sri Lanka can play a key part of that. I'm sure they will. So basically, you ignore them at your peril, I think, is the advice there. Listen... <laughs> Guys, it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you. So interesting. I could spend an evening in a bar talking to you about, <laughs> about right. it. So maybe one day we will. But anyway, we've got two very special guests coming up. Not that you aren't special, but <laughs> two got very unique offers uh, that we're going to talk about and explore in a minute. And I'm way over time. Uh, Hemal Malik, thank you so much indeed for joining us. Thank, thank you. We'll Rani. see you very shortly. Thank you. Bye-bye.